skill is in the relationship between the performer and the environment. It's not something that they store inside their head. So what that means for a lot of coaches is we need to really take um, in take into consideration the environment that we're presenting to the athlete uh, and how that kind of helps develop skill. Like if we put them in sterile environments, those skills that they develop, these will still develop skills, but they'll develop skills in that environment. And what we want them to do, we want them to be able to kind of develop skills that are robust and adaptable um, in dynamic environments. Welcome to the Cutting Edge Coaching Podcast, where we believe coaches are some of the most important teachers and leaders in the world, and they deserve to be supported. I'm your host, Luke Gromer, and every week we're bringing you conversations with coaches, experts, and leaders from across sports that will give you practical ideas and strategies that you can apply in your coaching to develop high-performing teams and high-character people. Coaches, I'm excited to welcome Dr. Tom Perry to the podcast. Dr. Perry has expertise in sport and exercise science specifically skill acquisition and performance psychology. His work focuses on the application of theoretical concepts to practitioner-based fields, such as sport coaching, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and fitness training. He has extensive experience working as a soccer coach and has consulted with coaches, physical education teachers, and therapists to enhance their work as movement practitioners. Dr. Perry's main research interest includes the investigation of factors that influence motor skill performance and learning, such as instruction, practice activity design, and the provision of feedback. He has recently published a motor skill behavior laboratory manual and currently serves on the editorial board of the United Soccer Coaches Association's Soccer Journal, writing pieces on the application of skill and acquisition theory. In this two-part conversation, we dive into what ecological dynamics is and how to apply the framework in your coaching including deep dives into understanding what skill is, using constraints, the role of repetition, and more. As always, if you enjoyed the podcast and you want to grab a copy of the free podcast notes, just go to cuttingedgecoach.com slash podcast or click the link in the show details to download a free PDF of notes from this episode or any episode of the podcast. Finally, if you're interested in a six-week book club with other coaches studying the fantastic book The Culture System by my friend J.P. Nurbin, or a five-month mentorship program, check out the links in the show details. Spots are limited for both. Now to my conversation with Dr. Tom Perry. Enjoy the episode. Coaches, really excited to have Dr. Tom Perry on the podcast today. Dr. Perry, uh, we're actually taking our second run at recording this podcast episode. The first time we had some technical difficulties, so excited to talk to you again today and appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me. Yeah, happy to. Uh, Dr. Perry, let's start off and let's start kind of broad with diving into what exactly is this theoretical framework of ecological dynamics. Um, I'd love it if you could just explain this framework to us and then after that we'll dive into how this applies to coaching. Yeah, so like the it really kind of came about, I think, from a, a discontent with traditional approaches or traditional uh, explanations. Um, so uh, information processing is the the kind of most common one, uh, kind of aligned with Schmidt's schema theory, uh, motor program theory. Uh, so in in this approach, in ecological dynamics approach, we don't believe that we're trying to develop um, stored mental representations of movements inside our head. Uh, we think that we can directly perceive information that will allow us to act. So like a, a key component of that, of this approach, is perception-action coupling. Like, uh, and again, there's some, some great phrases. Like J.J. Gibson is a, a big person um, who did a lot of this work uh, in his, historically. Uh, and said, we perceive to move, and we move to perceive. So this idea that I, when I perceive something, I perceive an affordance, an opportunity in the environment, um, I can act on that. 
right? Like I see a door handle, I can use it to open the door. Um, I'm playing soccer and I see a gap to dribble through, well, then I can dribble through. I don't need a mental representation uh, to kind of make sense of that, right? And again, there's another another good good quote that I really like. I just wrote this in a, in a paper. Um, I think it was by Keith Davids and his group. Um, and he, he said something along the lines of, um, you like you always do something somewhere right which that's kind of like another key component of this idea of what we call individual environment mutuality you cannot separate the individual from the environment and that's again another key problem with a traditional approach we often break skills down or we remove them from context um and then wonder why they don't transfer. Well, they don't transfer because the skill is in the relationship between the performer and the environment. It's not something that they store inside their head. So what that means for a lot of coaches is we need to really take, um, in, take into consideration the environment that we're presenting to the athlete uh, and how that kind of helps develop skill. Like if we put them in sterile environments, those skills that they develop, these will still develop skills, but they'll develop skills in that environment. And what we want them to do, we want them to be able to kind of develop skills that are robust and adaptable um, in dynamic environments. And that's kind of what sport is. So that's some key parts. I can't let you know, there's, there's way more that I'm, I'm sure we'll kind of, uh, we'll talk about as we move on. Oh yeah, that's I think a a great and important place to start just understanding some of those key components of it and I I really like and resonate with what you said especially there at the end around skill is that yeah, look, you can you can try to take a skill quote unquote out of context and break it down into these parts but you're just developing it for that context that you've put it in not the actual context that you want it to be used in the game, right? And and obviously the sport I primarily coach is basketball and and this is so so common is you th- you see a lot of one on zero skills training mm-hmm. and like you see you see people doing things with athletes when the athlete has been totally removed from the environment they're actually going to be at like you talked about in a dynamic environment like the game is and we put them in a sterile environment with cones and chairs and yeah there's still a ball in the hoop but everything else that's there when the game starts is all of a sudden gone and then we're surprised when like you said it doesn't show up in the game yeah there's a, there's, so a big, there's a big gap that i think is often missing between like you know, it, it, we're really talking about like the scale of representativeness right and game like the the game itself is the highest level of representativeness that doesn't mean that you should play the game all the time that's almost the opposite of what that says um but what you're trying to do is use an appropriate level of representativeness for the slice of the game that you're trying to replicate and drills are on the opposite end of that scale of representativeness so you like like the one versus zero doing skills against cones uh, and it, it's really getting people to understand that skill is in that relationship between the performer and the environment, right? Like it, it's it's not something you acquire and then, um, you know, in this magic gap, like it, it transfers somehow. And it's like, no, we need to know why it transfers. Well, representative design, which is a key component of ecological dynamics, it tells you that it's the representativeness that helps it transfer. You know I mean? So you, you have to kind of organize, organize practice in a way um, that is, again, appropriate for, for your level of participants. Um, so then they learn these relationships. Right? They, they learn how um, to perform in that environment. That's what we're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, as coaches, right, that should be what drives us is how do I actually help them get better at the game? And so I think what we're talking about right now, obviously, like you're 
talking about transfer there, that's the key. Like if I'm doing things in practice that aren't actually going to help them in the game, I should really be asking why. And that doesn't mean like, hey, I think there's a place for five or 10 minutes of just total fun in your practice, right? Like, the, but the, the majority of if we're actually trying to help them improve and get better at the game, you got to make sure like you're talking about it's representative and it's going to transfer. Well, I think some of that too is like, I think practice should be fun all the time. Yeah. Right. You mean like, I think there's a, um, like games are great learning tools, right? You can, uh, and for me, like learning technical skills and then making this assumption that it transfers, I think you're really doing skill a disservice <laughs> when, when you think about it that way. Um, you know, like games can be fun. Games are fun. Like for for a lot of kids, and they learn a lot of things implicitly that you know they will show up in a game. Like you don't have to like. I think we we've industrialized sport, right? Like we we've taken it from industry and said, hey, look, when they make cars, they do the same thing over and over again, and they do it in this sequential manner, uh, and it's organized and it's clean, and it uh, and so then we just we. Have, just dropped that kind of model onto sport. And sport is the opposite of a factory, right? Like, like it's never, ever the same. Like, you might see similarities, but it's never, ever the same, particularly in, like, team sports that, um, that we're interested in. But there's another good one. One of my friends, uh, Cal Jones, I don't know if you've seen any of his stuff uh, on Twitter, um, he, he said something along the lines of, um, like an ecological approach is not something that you can kind of pick up and choose when to use it. Like it, it's a lens that you look at skill from. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and I think that's a a big one for a lot of coaches maybe to understand is like like mixing and matching is not is not a thing, right? Like if you believe in direct perception, perception, action, coupling, you cannot believe in mental representations. They are just fundamentally different ideas. Um, that, that are contrasting, right? Like they, they, they don't align with that. Uh, and another one that he, he used that I really like um, is um, the context is not something that you kind of plug in once technique is developed, right? Like it, it's actually the mold that shapes the skill, right? Like the context, the environment is so, so important, right? Like you can do a passing pattern in basketball, but like, I need opponents, right? Like, you know, there's going to be a team that we play against that is going to try and stop us doing what we're trying to do. So how do we replicate an environment? And again, you can scale that. You can, if you if instead of 5v5, you could do 5v3, right? So you get lots of offensive opportunities. Um and then as they get better, you obviously up the scale. Like you, you add more defenders until it probably is 5v5. You add conditions on the game uh, or incentivize, incentivize things in the game uh, that encourage them to um, explore those behaviors. Yeah, I, I love, love those things you shared there. And you started to hit it there at the end. I, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the the model or framework, and I know you're a, a fan of him as well. He's a friend of the podcast. Alex Ramos and shares mm-hmm. a lot of great stuff yeah. on this in the basketball context. Um, but uh, w- and he was one of the first guys that started to expose me to some of these mm-hmm. ideas as a theoretical framework. I, I would say that um, maybe one a little bit of what I experienced as a player, and then two just a little bit. I don't know if intuitively is the right word, but. I would say that like when I saw this, I was like, yes, this is just putting words to kind of some of the philosophies I already had of like, if I want them to get better at the game. We need to play the game. And it needs to look like, so, so it was helpful, but he shared just a really helpful graphic uh, with the triangle uh, at the beginning with individual environmental and task talking about constraints and then an arrow towards perception and action. We talked about that coupling process and then another arrow towards movement solutions or, or skills. Right. Yeah. Um, and you started to talk about, I think, some of those uh, constraints. Can you talk about those three different constraints in the triangle, individual, environmental, and task? What are those? Yeah, so we, we, we 
the first one we call organismic but because we work with humans we say individual right because it, it explains animal behavior as well right that's the that's the great thing about it um so yeah so organismic individual constraints uh, they can be split into structural and functional so structural constraints are things like height weight you know, flexibility strength um those are, are those are structural constraints functional are more psychological in nature um, anxiety, confidence, things like that. Uh, environmental constraints. I like. I, I wish they would have called this performance context constraints, um, because when you say environment, a lot of people only think of weather, right? Which it is. I mean, like, like wind changes how we perform. You know, like the, the when the sun's going down, it's kind of shining in your eyes. It changes how you perform, so that that is a an environmental constraint. Um, but I, I like the word performance context because uh, things like surface, surface is an environmental constraint. Right? Like when you play for for us, like when you play soccer on turf versus grass, dry grass versus wet grass. Like the ball moves in different ways. You have to move in in different ways. Even in everyday life, when you're walking, carpet, tile, um, the sidewalk, ice, you know, like th those are all environmental constraints that will change your, your movement behavior. And then last one, probably the most important one for coaches, like I think you need to, I always say to my students, you have to take um, organismic and environmental constraints into consideration. You're not necessarily manipulating them right like do i think you should cancel practice if it's a bit wet outside no because i think that's a great opportunity to build adaptable skills right um yeah like the like but we, we don't change those right like they, they change on different time scales task constraints is that's where coaches can have um a real big input Right, so you can again, um, task constraints are broken down into task goal constraints, task rule constraints, and then task object implement constraints. So, task goal constraints that's where instructions would fit, right? When you tell someone to be accurate, they don't do things very fast, right? It's the speed accuracy trade off that you, that you get. Um, so like instruction can be explained through this constraints model right like it's not like in information processing i don't think it's as clear whereas uh, in in newell's kind of constraints model instructions would fit in that task goal category right like what you know, and also what is the goal of the game the goal is to get the ball into the basket right um task rule constraints are kind of like conditions that you would put on games right so you could um again whether it's through incentives or kind of um preventing certain behavior like one that i love for basketball uh, as a practice task um it, like you can do no dribbling some people argue with this like well you shouldn't remove a well, lot you shouldn't remove opportunities right I, I, yeah i'm still on the fence with that because i think i don't think that's true like a, 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 to me a constraint and to a lot of other people a constraint it puts up a fence so think of all the possible solutions that someone could, could come up with that's called a solution space when you add a constraint you're putting up a fence saying you're not going to find any good solutions over here right i want you to focus on this section like you know not this exact section but you will find a way for you it's very individualized that will be successful right so, like, yes, incentives can be constraints. So if I give you more points for a three-point shot versus a layup, I'm probably going to take more three-point shots, right? So if that's what you're looking for, that's a pretty good constraint or, or incentive. Um, one that I like in basketball, like if you look at, like, a motion offense, um, you want everyone to be moving all the time, right? Well, if you eliminate dribbling, you have to move, right? You have to move to get open. You have to move the ball quickly to get it to someone who, who's open and not 
having a contested shot, right? So like, even without saying, that's what the great thing about const- like a constraints led approach is, you can apply constraints that will um, encourage people to search for solutions, functional solutions, I would, I, I would call it. Uh, and then last one uh, is the object implement constraint. Uh, so you see that a lot in scaling, right? So like in, um, uh, in tennis, for example, the rackets are too big, too heavy, the balls are too high compression, right? Like it doesn't, doesn't give you good outcomes in that. So what I can do, I can scale equipment, um, make it a bit smaller, make the balls bounce less, use foam balls, bring the net lower, make the court smaller. And what tends to happen is you see actual tennis being played on these small courts um, that is more transferable to the, to the larger game, right? Like they're, they're, learning, they're learning skills, they're learning tactics because the equipment is appropriate for that particular level. Um, when we have equipment that's not appropriate for that level, you tend to get non-functional movement behavior. So much good stuff there. I, I, that was really helpful. Just breaking down those three different types of constraints. And I think, like you said, the, the, the rule constraints are really where you have a chance to step in as, as coaches and shape and impact the, the learning in the environment. And like you said there, uh, yeah, I, taking away dribbles is one that I do in basketball at times. Uh, like I'll, just for example, practically the teams that I just finished up coaching our seasons, uh, especially one of them, we just really, really struggled uh, throwing mm-hmm. passes to our own team. We just had so many poor passes that led to turnovers. I mean, it just cost us multiple games because we continued to throw the ball to the other team. And so there was a few different things I did. One, there were times where I took away their dribble. We, would, we played five on five full court and there was no dribbling. Like, mm-hmm. and, and the quality of their passes increased. Uh, two, I called uh, maybe passes turnovers. So if they threw a, like a, a long lob pass or the defender tipped the pass, it was an automatic turnover right then. I just blew my whistle. The team went the other way. Um, and then the other reason sometimes we were throwing poor passes is because we were playing without vision. And so if they caught it and they didn't get their eyes up towards the rim, uh, we called it a failure to peak and it was a turnover, right? And so like, and it, I didn't all have all of those on at the, at the same time mm-hmm. necessarily, but those were some of the different constraints that I put in place um, to try to, like, like you said, get them to look for a solution that's going to give them a better chance of succeeding. And as we went through the season, like, it, it did get better. Like we handled yeah. pressure much better. The quality of our passes improved. Still not to where it needed to be at times, but um, they, they started to get it. They, they also started to get like, oh, I have to come meet the pass. Like I have to come back to my teammate and close this space so the defender can't get it. And again, it was like so a lot of those things, like I didn't actually te- teach them it. I didn't have to yell at them to do it. I just changed the rules and they started to do it. Yeah, the, 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 I think the key is it's like you're trying to get them to find a solution, not the solution, right? Like, it, to me, I don't care what it looks like, right? I, again, I did in the past, but then the more I've learned about this as about skill and just paying attention to everyday life, um, does it achieve the task goal, right? Does the ball go in the basket? Does the ball get to my teammate right, in a way that they can use it? Right? That's what I'm focused on. I'm focused on a functional solution. Like functionals, not fundamentals, is a, a key one that um, Alex Sarama wrote a really good blog um, about that if people want to check that out. Um, but also as well, what you're talking about is we, we need to create an environment where coaches aren't as important as we think we are right like you made a great point there saying oh my players started to recognize they started to problem solve right what they need how they need to act based on the information right that's available right when i just stand still i'm really easy to mark okay great right so they they're doing the pro like we we need to empower athletes to make decisions. I find that now, like I am, let's call it lucky. 
uh, I work with two different age groups. I have my U19 uh, team that has some kids on that I've I've um, coached before, right? So it's a half and half, half new, newer kids from another team and then half kids from um, the previous years that I've coached. But then I also help with my daughter's team, which is a U8 team, okay? Very, very different. And I, I'm having the same problem and now I see why. Because with my U19s, the ones that I've not coached before, they really struggle to make decisions. They want to know exactly where they should stand and what they should do in a certain environment. And I, I always say, I was like, it depends on the context, right? Like, uh, so I, it's what I try and do. I try and kind of move towards more of a principles-based um, approach. Um, so we'll talk about space. When, there's, when we're in possession and we have space, I want you to dribble. Right, because then that will draw attention. That's why people drive to the basket in basketball and then kick it out. You're trying to attract defenders to the middle to create space somewhere else. Right? So when when there's no pressure, dribble. When there is pressure, pass. That's it. Right? Like so that principle works for any situation that they will face. Whereas if I say in this particular situation you should do this, I don't know that. Like, because there could be three defenders in that space. They they could be in a bad part of the field. Like, there's there's so many other variables um, that interact to dictate whether that's a successful action or not. But what we've done in practice, and what I see with the the, the young groups that I work with, um, we don't give them any autonomy. We don't give them any um, decision making responsibilities. Because they're joysticks, See, like they they do drills. They dribble towards a cone, and then turn away from it into a corner, and then join the back of the line. Right. So it's like it's a lack of understanding of what skill actually is, and the perception of information and and decision making is an important component of that. We need to make those activities a little bit more live. And again, you you can scale that. Like that's not something that has to be the full game all the time. You can. Um, you can scale up to the level of your participants. Yeah, I, I think that's so important to consider as well. I, it's funny as you were saying that in reference to the U18 that your daughter's on. I was just thinking about, I don't remember who it was with or when it was, but I had a conversation with someone and we were talking about youth basketball practices. And I said something along the lines of when it comes to most practices, kids would just be better off if their coach just let them play an advantage game the entire time versus what they're playing often or what they're doing in practice often, right? Like it'd just be better if those eight-year-olds played three on two for 60 minutes mm -hmm. versus going through these lines and drills. Like it, it'd be crazy how many times they had an opportunity to make a decision and well, they played two on two. Like, yeah, I, I I think it's so it, it it frustrates me when I see it, right? And it's like, man. But then again, like we talked about at the beginning, it comes back to we have some very uh, yeah, often we just have some wrong understanding of what skill is and how it's developed. And if you start with those incorrect beliefs, well, really like our beliefs drive all of our behaviors, right? As coaches too. And so if we've got some some beliefs that don't line up with how it actually develops, then of course what we actually do in practice is not going to get them to the place we want to. Yeah, I just wrote that in a, in a paper. I've probably written a couple of times in in a couple of papers. Um, but like your beliefs and assumptions about learning drive your methods, right? Like whether you articulate it or not, right? Like I can tell you, I believe in ecological dynamics. I can tell you that I recognize that players are playing under constraints and I'm actively trying to manipulate constraints that I can control to encourage them to explore like solutions, right? Like ways to solve this game problem. Um, a lot of coaches can't do that. And I don't think it's like, I don't think it's super necessary, right? That they can. 
But when I watch your methods, I can see what you believe. Right? Like if you do drills, you believe that skill is in your it is in your head. Right? Or even worse, muscle memory. Right? Like so so what I what I try and talk to people about if I'm trying to convince them of this new way is to say if the rationale that you're using for these drills is shown to be incorrect or flawed, surely you have to question the methods, right? Surely you have to look and say, well, if you're telling me muscle memory is not a thing, then why am I doing these drills if it's not to develop muscle memory, right? Like, and it's kind of sowing that seed in people that that doesn't exist, that, that kind of referring to a filing cabinet in my head and finding the right motor program in the moment based on probably a different situation is somehow better than real-time information i have a hard time believing that that's conceivable right like that doesn't make like i think we remember things i don't think we store it in our head and there's some research that's kind of pushing towards like a i think it's an active they call it an active memory um, where you remember based on your interactions with information, right? That's why when you lose your keys and you walk around, if you had memories, you'd remember where your keys were. But you walk around and then information from your environment triggers the remembering and then you find them, right? Like it's, I don't know, like I, I, I always struggle with that idea of, well, they, they, need, they need fundamentals first. They need to learn these techniques first, right? They, we have kids doing step, like step over. It's like doing a crossover in, in basketball. A crossover is only effective in certain situations, right? If I'm dribbling in space and there's no opponent, why would I do a crossover? That makes no sense whatsoever. But then we have kids dribbling towards a cone and doing step overs over the ball it's like, that's just completely non-functional, right? If you want to encourage some creative play, like you said, like play a game where it's 2v2. And if you dribble someone and do a move, your choice, whatever move you like, that goal's worth two. Hey, guess what? Guess what they're going to do loads of? They're going to try loads of different things. Does it matter what the score is in practice? No, they're eight. Right? It's, uh, it, it's, it can be frustrating, let's say that. Coaches, thanks for listening to this episode, and a huge thanks to Dr. Perry for joining me. You can find links to connect with Dr. Perry in the show details. And don't forget to check out the show details if you'd like the free podcast notes or you're interested in joining the book club or mentorship program. Thanks for listening to the podcast. We'll see you next week.